All right, we are streaming. I always check, make sure. All right, well, we're live. So hi, everybody. Welcome to Kindle Conversations for May. It's May, which is nuts. It feels like just yesterday it was January, but here we are, it's May, and it feels like July outside. So <laughs> what's time? Um, it's great to see you all. Um, I am Peppa. I'm the founding pastor and organizer of Kingdom Community. So glad we get to spend this time with you tonight. And I'm going to kick it over to Brad, our co-host. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining us. If you're watching live uh, <clears throat> tonight, we have a special guest, Dr. Zachary Moore, and I am going to pass it over to him to maybe introduce himself and tell us a little bit about his background. Welcome to the show. Yeah, hi, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for the invitation, Brad and Peppa. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is, is Zach, Zach Moore. Um, some people call me Dr. Zach. Um, I have been um, sort of in this, in this space, my um, sort of bona fides are that I spent about uh, a decade organizing a free thought community. Uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It's called the Fellowship of Free Thought. I was also involved with several other organizations in the general vicinity, um, including the North Texas Church of Free Thought, Camp Quest Texas, the Dallas-Fort Worth Coalition of Reason, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I've also been active uh, with some national organizations um, and some international organizations like the Foundation Beyond Belief, uh, for example, um, and the Freedom from Religion Foundation. And I've spoken at American Atheists. Um, so I've done a lot of work uh, sort of in the atheist slash humanist slash free thinker uh, community over the past uh, decade and some change. Uh, and now I'm, I'm sort of drawing down some of that activity. So I'm not I'm not doing quite so much. I'm sort of resting on my laurels a little bit um, in that domain and uh, just still happy to talk about that experience and, and sort of the things that we did and, and any maybe any lessons that I got out of that. Yeah. So uh, I, well, I, I suppose I, I met you kind of informally through Fellowship of Free Thought. Mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there was a period in my life where I was very, very thankful for that organization. And I know I understand that um, you had a, a heavy hand in founding that organization, really, really starting that up and organizing it. Um, would you care to talk about that at all? Yeah, yeah. So the, the Fellowship of Free Thought was an organization that was founded by myself alongside um, about 20 other people. So there was quite a, quite a lot of us that did all that together. Um, so I, I know I get a lot of the credit, but um, it was actually a lot of people pitching in, quite, quite frankly. Um, part of that, the, the organization of that was, it, I was a sort of a nexus point for that because I had been previously the executive director for the North Texas Church of Free Thought which was a very similar organization. Um, the, the intent of the Church of Free Thought model was to take the good parts of church and leave the bad parts behind, so to speak. Um, in practice, they probably could have stood to leave a few more bad parts behind. And that's part of, part of the reason why we formed the Fellowship of Free Thought as, uh, as specifically and explicitly not a church, but a, a fellowship and the distinction there might be minimal for some people, but um, it is a 501c3 organization and uh, completely democratic run by a board of directors, uh, no pastor role um, that exists, apologies to Peppa, um, but that, that's oh, not a role that was conceived of for that organization. Um, although I did serve as its initial executive director also for the first couple of years. So I had, I did have a heavy hand in getting all that together. And it, it's, um, you know, the, the, uh, they say it's like hurting cats, you know, getting atheists to do sort of anything is like hurting cats. And, and while that is true, um, I've, I've had cats in my life. It's, it's not at all hard to get cats to do what you want to do. As long as you have something that they really, really, really want. Um, and in, in our case, the thing that they really, really wanted was a community, a place to, um, you know, to, to meet, meet other people, um, you know, build new friendships, new relationships, uh, learn from each other, some of them just to let off some steam, um, to have some sorts of conversations that they weren't able to have uh, with their families, with their, with their friends and in, in the workplace as well. Um, they could have those with the Fellowship of Free Thought and I think that is still 
to a certain extent, a driving force for, um, for the people that are still active in the organization. Um, although I hope it's much less so than it was um, back in the George W. Bush uh, administration, let's say. Yeah. <clears throat> I know for a lot of um, atheists, agnostics, people just kind of questioning faith and end up, you know, maybe going through a deconstruction and, and end up on the, on the, uh, the side of, of walking away from it. Um, one of the things you realize pretty quickly that the church was a huge provider for was uh, that sense of belonging and community. Um, you've got, you know, your church family, your friends, the people that you can always count on seeing every week. There's, there's that whole community that's there for you to support you, to hang out with you. You, you know, you cook food together, you go over to each other's houses, your kids play together. And so for people to walk away, um, it, it's a big decision because you, you, know, you can sacrifice a lot. And so there is, that's probably one of the, the big things that I think the atheist community lacks is, is that, that sense of community. And so it was, it was nice um, when somebody that I knew uh, understood what I was going through at the time when I went through my deconstruction and they had kind of you know, invited me into this online group uh, at first. And uh, it was nice because there's other people there with similar stories and backgrounds. Um, you, you had people there to, to lean on and to just to vent to or to, you know, kind of reciprocate, hear their story. And it made you feel less alone. Um, and eventually I, I realized that there are all these meetups. They had these events. They were going and uh, they even had the, the monthly meetups where it actually kind of felt like a church. There, everybody got together. There was potluck, uh, usually a, a special guest speaker. Um, you probably uh, spoke a few times yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. So th yeah. that was that was really great to have that sense of community in, in a secular space. Yeah, and, and you really touched on it. It's it's the loneliness, I think, uh, either the, the loneliness or just the solitude of it. So um, when you join a, a faith community, it is a it's like a collective activity. Like you, you come to a group, you, you make those sort of initial overtures, you figure out the process, you express your desire to sort of join with that organization and everyone just sort of embraces you and they, they pull you in and there's, depending on the tradition, there's different sort of rituals or, or other things that you go through and everyone's celebrating along with you. But apostasy, um, which is what I call it. it. Deconstruction is sort of a newer term and I still like apostasy, the, sort of the old fashioned version. Um, apostasy is a solitary thing. Apostasy is not something that people do together. It's something that, that individuals do um, in, their, in their bedrooms, in their closets. Um, I, I kind of joke a little bit about it that uh, the, the, the sorts of intellectual conversations that apostates have with themselves um, happen in the way that according to the scriptures, Christians are supposed to have those conversations with God in that exact same way. It's not supposed to be a big public spectacle where you're praying, you know, on the street corner and drawing a lot of attention to yourself. It's supposed to be in, in quiet and private, um, just you and God. Um, and all the apostates that I've encountered have had those experiences where they've really kind of conversed with God and, and at the end of that process said, God, I don't think you're there. If you're there, say something, you know, and then there's, there's silence. Uh, and so apostasy then as a result is a very solitary and dare I say even lonely thing. And so the, the need for community, I think is even more pronounced uh, for people that, um, that have come out of a religious tradition. It might not be Christian, Christianity, it might be Judaism or, or, or Islam. Um, there are more and more people that are being raised in uh, secular uh, households, and including explicitly secular, like, like humanistic uh, households. And so they are not having those same issues. And I think maybe this is a, uh, a phenomenon that is sort of of a certain generation and will, will probably pass away. But for the time being, it's been very useful. Have questions. <laughs> I have some good, I have some interesting questions. Like, all right. So, as someone who was raised in a faith based household and then, like, obviously, like, bought in, right? Fully bought in, pastor, but is now leading this community, right? With folks like Brad, 
right? So I'm curious when you talk about church, not like faith-based church, but like use of use of the word church, what, and you touched on it when you said we left some of the good things in and tried to leave some of the not so great things behind. Mm -hmm. Would you mind saying more about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think yeah, there no, just I, might be some similarity, right? Like I think. Yeah, yeah. Most likely, probably. Um, and there's, there's probably, um, at least in the, in the very most high-minded possible way that you can interpret this, that the, um, the, the efforts of free thinkers are in some way a reflection or an echo of the reformers, right? Which, which generally mm -hmm. speaking, generally speaking, people that, <laughs> let's say people that aren't as up to date on their reformation history um, really look up to the reformers in a lot of ways. But um, at least the most high-minded way of, of thinking about them is this idea of sort of rejecting authority for its own sake, right? Right. So one of the things was, well, we do all these things because the church, and, and by and that time, I'm meaning the, the Roman Catholic Church, right? The Roman Catholic Church says uh, this is the case dogmatically, and therefore we have to go along with this. And, and that was a rejection of that. Well, so likewise, the free thinkers say, well, not just the authority of the church, but any authority for its own sake um, should not carry any weight in, in terms of um, how you how you process uh, epistemologically the world, right? Uh, and and to us to a lesser degree, and, and also somewhat as a sort of a derivative of that, um, is a very hard look at tradition, right? Because tradition often has its weight because it is given it by the figures of authority, right? They say you will do this thing because it's always been done this way because we always said you had to do it this way, right? Sounds like church. <laughs> and so, <laughs> well, and there's, there's loads of things that are traditions that, um, that, that may be fun and may be enjoyable. Um, you know, we just got through the, the season of Ramadan on, on the uh, Muslim calendar and they have a fantastic tradition of ending it with a big party. Right. So that's fun. I've been to those before. That's fun. <laughs> right. So there's aspects of traditions that are, look, if it's fun for its own sake, great. Um, but if you're asking questions about the world and the nature of reality, do we look for those explanations in tradition? Do we look for those explanations in what authorities are telling us? And free thinkers will say, no, we don't. Uh, and this this is something that Bertrand Russell elucidated a long time ago. Um, so I'm not saying anything new. Um, but if you're saying, well, we're not using tradition, we're not using authority, what are we using? Well, we have the evidence uh, of, of our of our eyes, of our senses, the things that we can see and observe and, and catalog, and um, and everyone can agree that this is this is something that we all see, right? Uh, and then we have our capacity for reason. And that's a bit of a slippier, slippier thing because you know we're all subject to certain cognitive biases that make it very hard to reason sometimes. Uh, but there are methods that are designed to help us reason as, as best as possible, just like there are methods that we've designed to help us um, evaluate evidence as, as best as possible. And so uh, to be a free thinker in, in that context means simply that whatever you believe about the world comes from those sources from evidence and reason and does not come from tradition and authority. And so it, it actually is not necessarily the case that a free thinker has to be an atheist. Right. It just very often works out that way. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and it is possible. And I've had this question uh, posed to me by religious believers because they really like the idea and the way you're describing free thought sounds really great. Uh, and we'd love to do that. Uh, is it possible for us to do that and be Christians? Uh, and these were specifically evangelical Christians at a, at a local megachurch. And I said, well, it's, yes, it's possible. And I wish you all the best because it's going to be very yeah. hard for you to do right. that in that environment um, with, within that sort of context. I think, so what you just said, I'm 
sitting here going, okay, like, yes. Mm -hmm. And I actually agree with so much of what you're saying, because I think that what religion, so, and I think Brad will speak, could speak to this, like, I'm probably one of the most uh, or least religious pastors you might ever meet. Um, like my friend jokes, like if you need a pastor to show up and bring you something that's not biblical, like I'm your girl. Um, and it's not that I don't value the tradition and it's not that I don't value all of the things in like traditions and the rituals and the things that brought us from before the reformation to this point. But the issue of power, right? The issue of power and privilege and authority for authority's sake is where for myself now I'm bumping up against, right? And to ask the question for, of, hey, this free thought sounds great, right? From the stature of like a local huge mega church. Yeah, your answer is exactly right. Like best of luck. Because ultimately mm -hmm. what I'm hearing you say, well, not ultimately, but what I'm starting to hear you say is it, it requires walking away from all of those things, right? Like it requires being willing to walk away from the authority and prestige that exists for the sake of authority and prestige. Yeah, if, if that is how you've anchored your world with, with those as, the, um, as the, the guide star, then yeah, that is, it's a challenge. And it's really interesting. When I, when I think about the concept of these uh, traditions that just sort of get, it gets put in place at some point, and then it gets adopted by all of the other people around that person, and they sort of pass it down through generations. And before you know it, like the, the history of that tradition gets lost, and people are just doing this thing. And they're like, Actually, I, I don't really know why we why we do it. It's just the way we've always done it. And then it reminds me of this uh, social experiment that I saw one time. It, it had to do with um, there was a paid actor um, that was going into a room with a bunch of people that were filling out. I want to say it was like job applications or some mm -hmm. type of a position. And so the room is full, let's say it's, you know, 20 chairs and each one of them is filled with somebody sitting in a chair, legs crossed with a, you know, a tablet on their lap and a pen. They're trying to fill out this application. Well, the paid actor goes in and somewhere off to the side, uh, somebody makes a noise. I don't know they like push a button and it kind of makes this buzzing sound. Well, the paid actor, every time the buzzing sound goes off, the paid actor stands up. And he you know, yeah. picks up his tablet and it's like, he doesn't really think anything. He just stands up and he's still filling out his application and looks around and then he hears another buzz and he sits back down and he's still like, no, like it's no big deal. And so it happens again. And then another person thinks it's kind of strange and they're looking at him and this is not a paid, they're not in on the whole thing. This person stands up and now they're both standing up, filling out this application. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a few minutes down the line, half the room is standing up when they hear yeah. this buzzing noise go off. And then, you know, 20, 30 minutes into it, the paid actor is now completely gone and removed from this scene. And it's all just normal people that are not in on this whole thing. But every time the buzz is happening, the entire room is now standing up trying to fill out these applications. And then it buzzes yeah. again and everybody sits down. And so nobody there has any idea <laughs> why they're doing it but they're continuing to do it and it's sort of this it's like it was an experiment with social cohesion and mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. acceptance and bonding with others and you know wanting to fit in and so uh, yeah i think that's a really interesting dynamic that, that comes along with some of these traditions yeah there's, there's another classic experiment from animal behavior studies where they did um uh pigeons they had pigeons in a cage and they had uh, a pellet of food that would, would come out and they had, there was a button that you could press and a light that would light up and a, and a buzzer that would go off. And they were, they'd done a lot of these studies where they're trying to get the bird to do a certain thing and then hit the button and then get the food pellet. And the birds were pretty clever at this. Um, and, and so they were able to get them to do all sorts of predetermined behaviors um, in order to get the reward. So at one point, somebody had the idea, what if we just completely decouple all the stimulus in this experiment and we, we, the button doesn't actually work. The light goes off at random intervals. The buzzer goes off at random intervals. And what happened was the birds, it, they weren't floored by this at all. They just came up with more and more complicated things, behaviors to do. 
because they were basically whatever whatever they were doing right before the food pellet came out, they just kept repeating that and adding to that. So it was a completely random set of behaviors that accrued, but the birds were able to repeat this to a very high degree of complexity, but it was a completely made up behavior that the birds um, had assumed would be the case simply because it was, they were getting random feedback from the environment. Yeah, yeah. I guess the one thing that kind of stands out in my mind is one of those strange traditions that uh, it doesn't seem like there's a really good answer to. When I think of kind of like faith-based traditions, uh, we were watching a movie about, I think it was, I want to say Orthodox, like Hasidic Jews. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was showed several scenes of them in their congregation. And, you know, when they, when they, when they're praying, they're, they're doing the, like a rhythmic, um, like a, a leaning kind of a thing. And I looked at it, I said, that's really interesting because the whole congregation is doing, not necessarily in unison, not together because everybody's kind of praying independently and they're doing it to their own. It's like the same rhythm, but nobody's together. And so, you know, I looked it up and I was like, what's, what's the story there? That's really interesting that that would be worked in. And I thought maybe it was, I didn't even know. I, I don't know if it was like a, like a, a, a poem with kind of like a, like a metronome thing that they were doing, reciting a, a prayer in sort of like a poetic fashion in their heads. But I looked it up and I was trying to look for the history of that. Like, what, where did this start? And it, it turned out there was several different scholars had these ideas about where they thought it came from. But the conclusion that I eventually arrived at was that Nobody really knows, but it's just something that they still do. And I was like, that's, that's interesting. I, I, wonder, I wonder why these people think that they are doing it. I've never, I've never had the opportunity to ask one, but I just think that that's an interesting thing. There's probably five different reasons that they all get. <laughs> there might be. Yeah. That's yeah. The, I, I found yeah. at least three. Yeah. So is there a way... Like I'm sitting here looking at this going like not a mega church and really trying to build community that is honest and leave space, right? Leave space, but also I would hope then because it leaves space also then generate space for different avenues of thought and different arenas of thought. So is there a way recognizing that I'm still tied to an institution, but not I'm like an institution adjacent now. Is there a way then for free thought, right, to manifest itself within this form of Christianity or a like less traditional form of Christianity? Or are the two mutually exclusive? No, uh, definitely not mutually exclusive. Um, and, and certainly there, there, there is room for that. And uh, there's religious um, free thinking as well. You just... Uh, again, whatever you, whatever your claims are, whatever your your beliefs that you have, if they come from your reason, so people have been able to reason themselves, right? So you you know hmm. Thomas Aquinas, etc. Uh, they've been able to reason themselves into uh, belief in God, you know. Uh, and so if you're coming from it from that perspective, and you're just saying, look, this is just a an an exercise in uh, sort of my uh, use of logical tools or my understanding of the, of the world and, and the way things look. If, if that's your framework, then yeah, you're, you're a free thinker. And there's uh, loads of Unitarians that I've, that I've met over the years. Um, a Mennonite, I think as well. Uh, it's, it's, so the, the, the big difference is uh, the sort of the evangelical, non-evangelical divide. And, and, and this is oh, no yeah. surprise to anybody that, that that's the, <laughs> that's the main um lens that that Christianity, at least American Christianity, um, is is sort of being viewed through right now. Um, it's a very different experience if you're on, on one side versus the other. I, I, yeah. I would say certainly you, I would consider you a free thinking Christian. I, I, in my view, the church is traditionally a very patriarchal institution, and it's like Zach was saying, it, it, there was there's always been authority there for authority's sake, and I think that you reject a lot of that for for different reasons, in a good way, a, a positive, productive, constructive, progressive way, yeah. which I really appreciate. 
Sure. And, and then the Quakers, right? The, the Quakers are yeah. so anti-authoritarian. They don't even have pastors, really. Correct. You know, so, um, and that's a, that's a, I mean, it doesn't go back 2000 years, but that's a very, you know, a long tradition in uh, sort of the English speaking world anyway. And, and, and yeah. it's, it's also a significant part of the, um, uh, the, the American experience, right? So uh, uh, Pennsylvania, of course, as you know, was, was founded as not explicitly a Quaker colony, but it was founded by a Quaker, right? With, with sort of his ideals in mind. Am I right? The, the Quaker like gatherings, right? They're the circle way, right? Like the, is that correct? Am I thinking of the right? Yeah, I think they just call it meeting. Um, meeting, right. Yeah. But it's, it's um, a friend of mine who is also doing work kind of similar to mine really practices the circle way. And I think she attributes, attributes it to the Quaker tradition where it is it's egalitarian, it's based mm -hmm. in equity and shared shared communal experiences that are not one person gets up and talks and has all the authority, but everybody brings their own authority and their own experience and wisdom into the room and all of it is valued the same, um, which I think is so beautiful. And it's like, I think is like, oh, what a novel idea. I don't know. I just this is where like me as a pastor, uh, which, yeah, me as a pastor, me as a Christian, I bump up against and I go, why, why do I have special whatever? Because I spent a little extra time in school, right? Like, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting thing to be, you know, kind of deconstructing it, right? That's like the new kitschy. Well, it's, it, you know, it, it's, in, it's in part because the role that you have is kind of a, a shadow of a shadow, right? So in, in much the same way that like the Church of Free Thought, uh, so the Fellowship of Free Thought was a kind of a shadow of the Church of Free Thought. And the Church of Free Thought was designed as a kind of a shadow of a standard church. Actually, both of the founders were Catholic, so they probably had like a, a Catholic church oh. in mind. Um, yeah. But, you know, the, the pastorate is um, derived from the priesthood. And, and the priesthood was not just um, an educated class of people. These were individuals who were ordained to intercede on behalf of the people with God. And so the role that they had was sacred. It, was, it still continues to be sacred, I suppose, if you're still Catholic. Um, but that is, um, yes, they were also educated and they, they learned a lot and they could speak with some, um, some authority from their education, but the real point of a priest was to be that ordained person who intercedes on your behalf with God. Um, and in the outside of that, you don't have that anymore. You don't have that. I mean, there, there kind of is like, you know, certain traditions will like lay on hands you know, when they what? ordain pastors and stuff like that, but it's, it doesn't quite carry the same heft spiritually, I would say that the Catholic tradition does in terms of its priesthood. Or, or oh, I would agree. Yeah. I would 100% agree. And I think part of, yeah, because, well, let's, I mean, there are a lot of traditions in which the fact that me as a queer female, like, that's a double, <sighs> double no-no in, <laughs> in terms of leadership. And so to be um, in this role, it almost feels like that shadow idea is really interesting because I actually don't believe that it's my job, right? Like, so like we've taken a few steps away from, or a lot of steps away from the idea of interceding on behalf of somebody. Other than, I guess that would be language that we would use like, oh, I will pray for you, but I never say or intend to pray for somebody with the understanding that they can't also then pray for themselves or for me in return. Like, it's just, it's such a fascinating, like I i don't know that I had ever really thought about it like that, which is probably problematic given that I'm a pastor, but um, it's an interesting thing to think about how we, or how I view this role in the scope of a larger tradition and what it could be used for versus what it often manifests as now in the yeah. larger narrative of Christian tradition. Right. Well, and, and 
and you can you can go further back in time too right so the catholic priesthood is itself a shadow of the old uh sort of pre-roman temple priesthood and their role was i mean they were it was a professional uh what would you call it cast i guess cast oh, yeah. class mm-hmm. um but they were slaughtering animals right right they were slaughtered they were doing blood sacrifice Mm-hmm. Uh, not for the fun of it. I mean, it, it was also a source of meat for them, but it, it, there was this very clear idea that you had to sacrifice blood in order to, um, to wash away the sins of, of the nation of Israel. But even that <laughs> is itself a shadow of more pagan ideas where you don't have like a, 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 a temple per se, but you have places of power. Right there, there might be di- like high places and low places, um, and even that um, that we associate maybe with with Greek and Roman paganism um, is a shadow of probably the earliest layers of uh, spiritual leaders that were um, just doing all sorts of crazy things. We don't even need to get into now. But 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 what I'm saying is that there is a continual um, flow of how this position has changed over time it's not just merely all right well then there's priests and now there's um you know queer female pastors all of a sudden boom right <laughs> there, there's a whole progression and yeah. and oh, yeah. so if if you look at that from the complete historical context what it seems to be is um an an approach of a, a, a way of approaching god with more clarity over time, right? So you, if you look at the, the earliest stabs, the earliest attempts at this, they were trying to commune with God and, and create a relationship between um, the gods, let's say, and the people, uh, however that, that manifested. And that was still the fundamental thing, but the clarity has improved over time so that it's not necessary to slaughter animals and it's not necessary to you know, hold up wafers and, and bless them, right? Um, just, you've, you've probably seen some of the images of the James Webb t- telescope as it's being calibrated and how they're comparing it with some of the other um, telescope images that they've, and the, and the clarity is just amazing. It's kind of like, um, I don't know, uh, Peppa, when you started to wear glasses, I started to wear glasses in the fourth grade and I could not believe when I put them on for the first time that you could actually see the individual branches on trees. Or at least. Right. And so, uh, yeah, it was amazing. It it was amazing. Um, But Mm -hmm. up until that point, like my world did not account for this reality that, that you could, you could actually see things like that. And then Mm -hmm. things change. And now I can see much more than I could see before. So I see the, uh, in, in terms of the, the spiritual leadership needs of humanity, I see an increasing clarity being um, sort of, developed and, and, and even in some cases engineered as we understand more about the God concept and, and what aspects of the God concept are helpful to humanity. Yeah, that's really, yeah, that's fascinating. I'm like, okay, I have to like process that for a moment, but that's <laughs> like, it's <That's> okay. true. <laughs> Well, I would like to talk a little bit about, um, or if I'd call it your role within sort of the free thought community, the atheist community. Um, But I I think historically there has been uh, a lot of animosity and tension between, you just want to call it generically, believers, non-believers, almost like, you know, two factions across a battle line. Um, And I think if you go online, that's, that's still pretty true, but um, I, mean, I guess maybe I could speak to that uh, a little bit as well. Yeah, I think um, a lot of people that sort of exist online, if you go to online spaces where you're seeking out, you know, theological discussions, philosophical discussions mm-hmm. um, about religion, uh, um, specifically between, you know, atheists and theists, um, I think there are some kind of stereotypes and, and stigmas that, that start to occur. And, and one of the, the stereotypes uh, that you'll, you'll find pretty quickly is that 
you know, all, all atheists are just really angry, kind of nasty people. And, um, <laughs> and in some places, you know, maybe, maybe you can find that type of an attitude. And, and I think what I've kind of come to understand is uh, if, if you're noticing a lot of people online that seem angry, uh, specifically with non-believers, I think there's, there's probably a reason for that. And it, and it's, it has a lot to do with what you, uh, what you lose when you walk away from a faith and a, and a faith community. Um, a lot of people end up very isolated and alone. Um, there's a lot of resentment and guilt and shame and pain and anger. Uh, and so these people feel isolated and they're feeling all of these complicated emotions pretty much in isolation. And so for them, a lot of times, the first and maybe the only community they ever find who might be an online group where they're not pe meeting people in person, which maybe is in, in some scenarios that can be kind of a recipe for disaster because we're already our worst selves when we go online anyway. You know, everybody kind of <laughs> not... Uh, we don't tend to, to be, you know, the best human beings online and, and being charitable and forgiving. So you sort of have these kind of dejected uh, people that go and they gather in online spaces. And, and there is a lot of anger there. Um, and I, 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 th I think my interpretation is that people are angry because they're still feeling a lot of pain and rejection and a, and a huge sense of loss. and. For me, I think I, I definitely went through a phase like that um, for a few years. And eventually I, I was able to reconcile all the things um, that I was angry about. And I was able to repair some relationships that I think had been damaged. And ever since then, you know, I, I felt uh, all of that is pretty much dissolved for me. I, I no longer feel that way. And, and so I, I feel like I'm out of my 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 angry atheist phase and going online and you know picking fights because that's just I, I don't know it was just like a a, a way to vent uh, in a way um, and so for me and I don't speak for everybody um, I, I I now see the the error in in all of that and it, it kind of felt wasteful and, and maybe even harmful um, and I feel like. I would rather spend more time finding common ground with the other side and, and building a bridge and, and seeing what kind of a path that the two sides could forge together moving forward. You know, how could we work together instead of fighting with one another? You know, how could we be more productive and beneficial to the rest of humanity instead? And that's why I, I find some of your uh, um, speaking engagements to be interesting because I think that you have a similar mindset and, and I don't want to, I don't know, would you like to speak on that a little bit? Uh, sure. Yeah. So with regard to the sort of the atheist or the angry atheist stereotype. Um, so it is the case that there are uh, many uh, apostate atheists or deconstructed uh, atheists that that, yes. go through that phase that you're, that you're talking about. Yeah. Probably um, an important clarification there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I've seen that uh, for sure. Um, there, there's also there are also atheists who are angry for very good reasons, and, and so I, I absolutely do not want to uh, sort of limit their or, or cast any aspersions on their own experiences and their own feelings. Um, there are certainly lots of people who have every right to be angry because of things that have happened to them, um, and. There's also an aspect of being a very tiny religious minority uh, in, a, in a society that uh, takes loads of, of opportunities to either dump all over you or ignore you. Uh, and that, you know, causes some anger as well. Um, so because, because there are legitimate sources of anger, reasons for anger, justification for anger, um, I, I give a lot of leeway to those people that are experiencing that. And I don't say that it's necessarily wasted time because anger can be a proper response to a situation that, you know, that, that causes it. Um, I do think in the long term it is unhealthy. And I, 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 I would love to see more people either process their anger, or deal with it 
um, or, or move past it in some way. I also want to point out that this, this idea of the anger atheist is kind of a modern thing, right? So mm -hmm. it, it really only came about because of Melon Murray O'Hare um, and the, the personality that she had uh, when she created American Atheist back in the 60s. Uh, prior to her, so atheism was never very, very common uh, among Americans. I mean, you could, you could say some things about some of the founding fathers and some of the ideas that they had cutting up Bibles and things like that. Um, but very few like actual atheists. But th that being said, people who were atheists um, were not really that threatening. In fact, uh, are you familiar with uh, Robert Ingersoll, the, the 19th yeah, century Yeah, Robert speaker? G. Ingersoll, yeah, uh, Mistakes of Moses. So yeah, well, he, he would give talks. He would go from town mm -hmm. to town and he would have crowds following him uh, like Justin Bieber does today. He was so <laughs> incredibly popular. And, and, and these were not huge crowds of, of American atheists. These were just regular people, but he was so uh, intelligent and could, could and, and respectful also, and he could, but he could also you know, get a, a witty biting remark in every now and again. People just loved listening to him, right? So the idea of the, the angry atheist is, is really more of a modern thing. It's, it starts with Mala Murray O'Hare and the, the, the tack that she had, um, when she created American Atheist as primarily a, a protest vehicle, uh, an, an activism vehicle, and, and how she presented herself. And um, I never met her personally, so I can't say what sort of person that she was in real life. I do know some people that have met her personally. Um, but my assessment of her is that she was, at the time, the really the only type of person that could have made atheism any sort of mainstream thing at all in the, the United States. And, and even her, uh, what she did probably wouldn't have been the case if it hadn't been for the um, sort of like the anti-communist, uh, uh, like the Red Scare stuff that was happening in the 50s, where the, the United States culturally felt the strong need to distinguish ourselves from the atheist, godless communists in the Soviet Union, right? And so as a result, we played up um, how religious that we actually were. America had not really been that religious prior to that point. Um, all the Ten Commandments monuments went up in the 50s and, and all these other things. Um, and and God, God We, we trust, trust went on the money in the 50s, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so this, this angry atheist now is more, it's, it's kind of a modern thing because of the fact that um, Madeline Murray O'Hare was, she was angry <laughs> and she made sure everybody knew it. And so everyone that's come after her in that, in that mold, in that same mold, most recently, I suppose, David Silverman, um, who was also president of American Atheists and went on you know, Fox News all the time. Um, he was very good at projecting that uh, uh, attitude as well, so. But there's, there's loads of, um, there's loads of, of, of ways of being atheist out there aside from that phenomenon. Um, and so there are, there are, you know, many of the other organizations that I mentioned, Camp Quest Texas, Foundation by Belief, these are not protest organizations. These are uh, humanist focused uh, primarily. Uh, and, and humanism is also something that we could loop back around in because humanism as a philosophical tradition came out of uh, religious thinkers uh, in the in the Enlightenment and the Renaissance period originally. So humanism was a re religious, or it, it at least came from a, re a religious um, incubation, um, and and now it is considered more of a secular thing. That also is kind of down to one person who was uh, one of Madeline Murray O'Hare's contemporaries, Paul Kurtz, uh, who was a philosophy professor in New York uh, in the 60s and 70s. And he felt very strongly that humanism should be the domain of secular people, not religious people. And so he fought very hard um, against religious components within humanism. Well, that's interesting, because I could see some ways in which even myself as an atheist, I, atheist, I, I think I could come up with a, a sort of like a Christian interpretation of humanism. But oh, yeah. Well, so there, just me there have been, um, I think we're on the third humanist manifesto, the third. third okay. of it. The very first one was signed by all sorts of religious leaders uh, in the United States. So it was the second one. That, that was more under Kurtz's uh, purview. And so the second one became 
explicitly secular. But, but the first one was a religious document as well. Okay. I'm gonna ask what may sound like a dumb question, but what are the like tenets of or values held by humanism? Yeah, so, so humanism is, so whereas free thought uh, has more to do with epistemology, like how we know about the world, mm -hmm. humanism is more about um, like morality and ethics and, and the things that we value about the world, right? Um, so they're, they're complementary. You can be a free thinker and a humanist um, and, and they, and they kind of touch on different things. So, but essentially what, what humanism is, is a, is a, philosophy and, and ethical structure that places the, the, the center of that ethic uh, is, is human good or human flourishing, right? So um, the things that are good to do are things that lead to uh, better lives for people, essentially. If, if, you're, ah. if you're doing an action that improves people's lives, uh, makes them happier, more, more prosperous, um, eliminates you know, ways for them to be in, in pain or, or suffer, et cetera, then that is humanism, essentially. I'm on board with that. Like, yeah, well, and then you can go, and, and human, so there's the third uh, humanist manifesto and the, the third humanist manifesto gets into quite a bit more detail in terms of like specific things, like a lot of social justice initiatives are included in that as well, because they're seen as stemming from uh, the human being as sort of the, the ultimate good in terms of maybe not, um, maybe not the metaphysical domain, right? But in terms of uh, the, the physical domain uh, here and now, uh, the, the flourishing of human beings um, is, is the core concern. Right. And, and everything just loops back around to that. So why does environmentalism have value, let's say, within humanism? Because we live in the world, right? And, and if, if humans live in a, in a shitty environment, um, then we're not going to be happy and we're not going to prosper, right? So it's important to, to take care of, of the environment. Yeah, <laughs> so I've heard. <laughs> yeah, well. We don't need, yeah, we, it's interesting because we had a really great conversation with um, one of our friends who also works in faith-based climate work and the church is, as we found out in that conversation, responsible for a lot of the mess we're in. <laughs> so like, I just it, keep going, Ooh. It, it can be, although it's, it's really unfortunate to me because within, uh, well, within Judaism and Christianity, and I, I suppose Islam as well, um, you have a really great argument for why humans should take care of the environment, right? There's the whole stewardship yeah, angle, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and all three of those traditions can, can draw from that and I think should. And if they don't, yeah. I think it's to their detriment. Yeah, and I'll clarify what I mean by the church is responsible. So the church, I'll, Presbyterians, I'll just name it, um, they were responsible for some of the most early investment in fossil fuels. And so it is, it's an interesting thing to watch because I 100% agree with you. Like when we look at the early pre, pre commandments, right? When we look at just the creation stories across mm -hmm. traditions, people, humans are created to steward and tend to the earth and to help it flourish. And it's really, um, it's heartbreaking to look at the ways that church, Christianity, right? And people in general have strayed from that. Like I'm not just, I think we all have a part in that, but um, it's just an interesting thing that those who come from traditions where it's pretty explicit that we are supposed to care for the world don't right? Like we have to ask some hard questions of ourselves in that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, I wish we would pay more attention to that because I think to the humanist point, then it actually does benefit the greater good of humanity to do that. Yeah. So what are some of your thoughts on, um, you know, kind of I jump back to, to what I was saying earlier about, <clears throat> I, I think that you have a lot of great ideas about how um, atheists and theists alike can move forward together in a more productive 
way? Well, um, so I, I actually did have a, an explicit bit of advice uh, for, for atheists. I gave a talk at, at the American Atheist Conference a few years back, and the, the, the central thesis of it was, let's not have anything to do with evangelicals anymore um, for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, the, uh, although evangelicals have been uh, the, in the United States, uh, almost everything I have to say is relevant to the United States only, um, but in the United States, evangelicals have been the dominant group within Christianity, including um, in terms of total population, um, but that is changing. Uh, it is, is it, it, it's, it's changing in part because there are actually fewer of them now, so they, their numbers have started to drop, but also the number of people like me uh, and, and like you, Brad, are increasing. Um, like uh, people like you, Peppa, I'm afraid are kind of plugging along there, um, <laughs> slow but steady. Um, yeah. But the but the none of the aboves, let's say, which includes atheists, agnostics, uh, basically anything that's not any recognized religious tradition whatsoever, um, that has increased rapidly since the early '90s, essentially. And so the way that um, I think atheists have tended to think about themselves. Uh, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying before about Mellie Murray Hare and, and, and how she came out of that uh, environment that was trying to uh, shove a particular type of Christianity down the throat of every single American. Um, and she was a tiny, tiny, tiny minority trying to punch above her weight, let's say. Um, and so because of that, atheists since her time have always had that mindset that they are the um, out, outnumbered, outclassed, outspent, et cetera. And they always have to punch above their weight and, and try to find opportunities to engage with, with theists, you know, primarily evangelicals. It's, it's almost exclusively the, the evangelicals that um, have been the problems for, for atheists over the years. Um, but now that is changing. And as of uh, a couple of years ago with the general social survey results, there are actually more nuns, none of the above, then there are even evangelicals. So that group of people is the largest group of um, religiously identified people in the United States. And so because of that, I say that atheists don't really have to engage with evangelicals anymore because at, we, we used to, because they were the ones that were causing a lot of the problems and they, they, they will continue to cause problems uh, for the near future. Um, but they will die out. They are already dying out. And so uh, the best thing for atheists to do is number one, focus on themselves as a community, form community groups like the Fellowship of Free Thought and others, um, do more charity work and, and community engagement, stuff like that. Um, we can also engage with our uh, religious neighbors in interfaith activities, I think, and have very productive uh, things that, that we can do. I've been active for the past uh, five years or so with a group called Peace Together, uh, which is based primarily in Tarrant County. Um, and it has done, uh, it's done a lot in terms of uh, increasing interfaith visibility and sort of interceding with uh, local politics that, that often runs counter to that idea, unfortunately. Um, so we can we can do things like that, um, and 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 create community and have dialogue and 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 have you know good suggestions, good ideas, and 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 I think you know sort of cross pollinate a little bit even and and have an appreciation for each other, and we don't have to give ourselves the heartburn that we've constantly been subjected to over the years, trying to debate with evangelicals and, and, and go to their apologetics conferences and, uh, you know, trade angry missives on different message boards and Facebook and Twitter, we can just be done with that. And I think we should be done with that because I, I, the only thing it really does is it contributes to uh, this stereotype that you mentioned earlier about the angry atheist online. That's primarily where people see that. Um, and it also gives them a lot of oxygen, right? Because the more that we engage with them 
and and I I see this, so I, I'm still subscribed to uh, a couple of apologist emails, um, newsletters that go out, and every time they're able to get an atheist to debate them, they love it. They write a the whole big write up of it. They send it to all their donors, and they say, "Look at what I'm doing. Why don't you donate to me some more money?" Um, you know, by by engaging with them, uh, we're making their careers for them essentially. And I don't think we need to do that anymore. It doesn't, it, it doesn't help us uh, anymore to this, to the extent that it does them. It helps, it helps evangelicals much more than it does atheists these days, because it's so easy for, uh, for people to see anything that an atheist wants to put out there. They start a YouTube channel or a website or a blog or whatever. It's so easy these days. Whereas evangelicals are still kind of stuck in their churches. Yeah. Sitting here going, yeah. Like as yeah. a member of a disenfranchised <laughs> community, right? Like yeah. that evangelicals really love to target. Um, people, I get asked all the time, like from a faith perspective, how do you engage with people who talk about homosexuality as a sin? And how do you engage with people who really are just so concerned with your salvation? And I'm like, I, I don't, I don't. <laughs> because if they've already decided that, like, what's the point? Like if there's i'm not going to change their mind and i don't have any interest in my mind be, right like yeah. there's there's some point where choosing to disengage because you what you said is exactly right it gives them oxygen and it gives them power um and it's interesting because so much of the work that i think we're trying to do with kingdom community is really create space where believers, non-believers, like people from all backgrounds, walks of life can actually come together and start doing work for the greater good, recognizing that it actually doesn't, like I can be friends with Brad and have a great respectful conversation with Brad because at the end of the day, I don't ultimately have this burning like drive to feel like I need to save his soul from something. Like, it's just, it's so fascinating to me, the amount of um, arrogance, I think that it, maybe that's the wrong word. I don't know, but this whole idea of like, we as people have the power to somehow redeem other people through tactics of fear and judgment. Like that to me is backwards when really there's so much space for abundant relationship that is generative and productive if we actually just afford each other the dignity of humanity. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. And I wish it were different. I really do. Me too. Um, I, I spent <laughs> I spent a decade, over a decade, doing everything of the opposite of what I would just rec recommended. Um, and I, I think it's doubly unfortunate because um, so, you know, we've sort of painted evangelicals as like the sort of collective boogeyman that's out there. Right. But let's not forget that they are human beings too. I was an evangelical completely, 100%. I was an evangelical. Um, the thing that keeps people like that where they are is fear, right? So they, they are using these techniques um, of, of uh, verbal violence, psychological violence, and sometimes actual physical violence um, on others because that is what they have feel has been done to them. And in many cases actually has been done to them, right? And so they are perpetuating this very toxic system that they themselves are feel trapped in. And, and many of them um, cannot imagine a world outside of them. And they don't necessarily love the world. They just, they're terrified of, of what might be outside of it. Right. And so I wish I had some better way of, of reaching them. Uh, I, if, if I had it, I would have used it. And if anybody else right. would come up with one, I would be, you know, first in line. <laughs> but, but right now, I think the only thing to do uh, for my own sanity and, and, and psychological health is, is to do what I've prescribed, which is to kind of write them off, at least for the time being. Well, and I think it's important to name too, like as the Christian in the room, right there, it's really easy to paint the evangelicals as like, like you said, this big boogeyman of 
its thing. Mm -hmm. But it's also important to name the ways that the breakoffs from the evangelical church. So like traditions that are Protestant traditions that are traditionally now and more contemporary and modern, right? Like, yeah. and liberal, as you would say, more progressive. Um, they still haven't dealt with all of it either, right? And they still, yeah. they still hold on to a lot of fear around the other, right? And so harm is done in that in ways I think that are almost a little more insidious than evangelical circles. I love when I make Brad smirk, like, <laughs> um, because I think sometimes the benefit of at least as, as a Christian, I can look at evangelical churches and go, okay, well, I know like that's not a space where I'm welcome, right? I know that, mm -hmm. but I can walk into some other churches that may not be evangelical and I have to wonder, and sometimes I have to find out the hard way, right? Yeah. And so there is, there's, there's something I think that those traditions that are based in faith that are not evangelical, right? And would proclaim vehemently so, that they need to do the work to be a little more explicit about their, the work that they need to do to actually be less harmful. Yeah, no, that's a very fair point. I've, um, I, I've encountered that a little bit. I not not quite so much anymore since I've kind of pulled back. But I, I've seen quite a lot of progressive believers. Um, I think they they reached this point where they sort of realized that oh crap, the evangelicals are telling me that I might as well be an atheist. I'm looking around at the stuff that the atheists were saying, and I'm agreeing with a lot of it. Maybe I really should be an atheist, right? And so they they sort of turn around and say, I got to run, I got to find some, um, some way to justify the fact that I'm, I'm religious, I'm a Christian or whatever. And they'll just grab whatever is, whatever can work for them. And oftentimes it's quite weird. Um, you huh? know, there was one like really progressive uh, lady I knew who got super into demonology. And, and she was, she started seeing the entire, the entire world and in, in like demons fighting angels and like, like literally. Oh. And I'm like, wh where did this come from? <laughs> it seemed like she just I saw that. I saw that movie. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And Keanu you. Reeves in it. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's interesting. It's really interesting. I just, yeah. Look. This is really fascinating to me because it's so much like your experiences and my experiences are not all that different, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's just, it's very interesting. I don't think I've latched onto anything a little loopy quite yet, but <laughs> there did. And I think maybe because I didn't grow up here, like, and I don't know, mm -hmm. Brad. I know you're from here, and Zach, are you a native Texan? I'm a Ohioan actually. Ohioan. Okay. Yeah. So I grew up on the West coast. Um, and so my understanding of faith and church was so much based in community and art and shared good and really care for the world around us and creation. And so when I left that space and moved to Texas, um, I was pretty clear, like religion, it, it, it made me question like, whoa, okay, what am I doing? Um, because I think there's there's just a lot of space where, like, I, I guess my question at this point is like with atheists and humanists, I think there's also space for interplay between people who would ascribe themselves as like spiritual or faithful, but not religious, right? And so mm -hmm. do those two parallels do those feel like they align or is there, I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot of maybe false, not false, but I just feel like we put ourselves in these labels where it's like, I don't the know. The labels I, are almost I'm, counterproductive I'm at some times. Rambling, but it, this is just- No, no, no. My... <laughs> it, it's a, it's a, no the, the, the spiritual but not religious thing. So it's, it's very common. It, it drives- the sort of analytical atheists completely up the wall because they're like, what do you mean you're spiritual, but not religious? You know, what, what is that? 
what are you even trying to say? It's nonsense. It's like saying, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I feel so circular, but I've also got right angles. It's like, no, you can't have them both at the same time. Yeah. Um, but, but that's a good analogy. But, but <laughs> I actually think that there is a way of squaring the circle, so to speak. Um, so, and, and so you you know this, I'm, I'm sure. So, in 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 Genesis one, um, it talks about the the breath of God moving over the world, right? And in Hebrew, breath is ruach, ruach right? Yeah. It also means wind, right? Correct. So it's 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 not just breathing, but it's 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 the the wind, and, and by, by which I mean the the air that's that surrounds us, that, that's moved by God, um, when. Adam is created and he's formed out of clay in the, in the second Genesis account. Um, God breathes the life into him, right? And again, it's Ruach. So the more time that any group of people spends together, if they, if they meet together in a room, the more time that they spend with each other, the more of their breath actually gets shared. Right. So if we were all sitting in a room together, I'm speaking, I'm breathing out the molecules, the literal molecules of air that I'm breathing out, the longer time that we spend together go into you. So I breathe out, you breathe in, you breathe out, Brad breathes in, Brad breathes out, I breathe in. Eventually, we'll have sat in that room long enough that every single molecule of air will have been breathed out and, and, and breathed in by all of us. And I just so, point out that this so this has been our absolute nightmare for the past two years. It is a bit ironic. So I came up with this metaphor before COVID, but but definitely with with the context of COVID, it's taking Don't a different tack. Still it's hold. But um, but but my point is COVID, that this is a beautiful metaphor, right? But my point is that the thing that connects us is our breath, mm-hmm. and breath is ruach, which also means spirit. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about being connected with each other, we're talking about our spirits get shared with each other. And that is not so that I'm what I've just described is completely naturalistic. Right. I'm not making appeal to anything supernatural there, but I'm talking about a concept. I think that everyone intuitively understands that the more time you spend with other people, the more you are connected with them. And that, I think, is the the essence of that spiritual, but not religious, it's people that are desperate to find connection with other people, but they don't like the systems that are in place right now, or they haven't encountered a system uh, that makes sense to them, but they are still are very hungry for connection. And I think that's something that all human beings have in common. Ah, it's funny because as you started, (laughs) as you started talking about Ruach and how it means wind, one of my favorite ways like in talking with kids right because if you try to explain the concept of god to kids it's like what <laughs> like it, you start talking and you're like this actually sounds a little bit silly um but like it's true listen and so one of my favorite ways to talk about god or like the idea of creation and the holy spirit is to talk about the wind and trees and i always say like for for me as a person who agrees like that that and who believes that that story is part of the larger narrative of how the world came to be maybe not the total sum of it but part of the narrative um that's how I explain it to kids is like look at the trees and when you see the leaves rustling and when you feel the wind on your face and when you see grass blowing in the wind that is the same life force that lives in you that is the same thing that exists in all of us and gets shared between us that is the spirit of humanity that goes from me to you and you to me right so that's the connecting point so i think that's beautiful just how you describe it it um... sorry go ahead no you go 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 no (laughs) it was a uh a uh a story out of Zen Buddhism, or if it was a Chinese proverb, but it was it was a story about the flute. Basically, it's just this solid, inanimate object that does nothing. It is essentially nothing until somebody breathes a breath through it, and then suddenly mm-hmm. 
it makes this amazing sound that's you know being sort of put into it and then it is this thing it, it has characteristics it's like the embodiment of music but without that breath flowing through it then it's just it's just another hard and animate object yeah yeah, beautiful. And you, 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 you were speaking about the, <laughs> the concept of spirituality kind of driving some of the more analytical atheist crazy. And it's, it's funny. I think there's a, uh, yeah, well, I don't know. Sam Harris seems to be probably one of the most, <laughs> one of the most uh, famous atheists in the entire world. And, you know, he, he's been on this, this whole uh, kind of spiritual kick over the last uh, few years. Um, which, which I think is just, a, I wouldn't say a contradiction. It's just strange because when you talk about an analytical atheist, I mean, he, to me, he is like C3PO, uh, like yeah. just in human form, but, uh, <laughs> but he's got a very deep spiritual side to him that he's been exploring over the past uh, few years, very publicly. Yeah, no, ab- absolutely. Yeah. So uh, probably Sam Harris is, is maybe the archetype of that, like analytical atheist that thinks not thinks too much, but um, I, I, I think I put it this way. Um, the only um, the only thing that Sam doesn't understand is everything that's outside of him, I guess. Um, so <laughs> if, 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 if a thought originates in this, and this is not meant to be insulting, I, I think he's a very, no, smart guy. I, I no, gather that that's he's just highly great. intelligent, but yeah, if a, if a thought originates in his head, he, he can grasp it and, and expand upon it. Uh, if a thought comes from someplace else, he just, he cannot, he cannot grasp it, I think. And maybe that's the thing, uh, maybe that's the thing that caused psychedelics for him to be so interesting as a subject because it shuts off or it, or it not, maybe not shuts off, but it um, reprograms that aspect of his own psychology is his cognition to the point where he's experiencing things that make no sense to him that he he would not come up with these visions or 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 thoughts or whatever on his own and yet uh the 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 chemistry of whatever he's been exposed to has caused his brain to to do these things on on its own um and that is a a um an experiential contradiction for him and i think that made makes that so fascinating for him but but yeah this sam is um frustrating well he's, he's very fascinating to, to listen to i think mostly just because he asks interesting questions and I, th- I think that's 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 being able to ask good questions is something that i really do respect um the best churches that i've been to are and and i include like uh, you know, like, like Buddhist temples and, and other places like that. And that the, the best ones that I've been to are, are the ones that have really good questions that they ask. It's rare that they offer good answers, but I really like good questions and, and having that posed in, in that way. Um, so Sam does that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I appreciate him anyway. It's, he's, his analytical take on, on everything. Although I, I would have to admit, I, I haven't, uh, I think I followed him as closely as I used to. But that's an interesting, interesting guy. guy. <laughs> C3PO as an atheist, that's that's pretty much him. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, Papa, do you have any other thoughts or questions? What you just said about churches that ask questions, right, and rarely offer good mm-hmm. answers, I think. That's one of the things that the further into this work with this community that I do, I'm realizing the more I'm willing to hold in a spirit of curiosity instead of a spirit of certainty, right? Mm -hmm. And I think it's funny because I listened to um, a conversation with Brene Brown and Richard Rohr the other day. And Richard Rohr is like, one of the main pillars of spiritual thought. And he said, like, one of the main things about being a faith-based person is you actually have to be curious. Like you have to not, part of faith is actually recognizing what you don't know and being comfortable with that and being comfortable with the mystery. And um, so that spirit of curiosity that you mentioned, like that 
to me, I think whether one is a believer or not, the spirit of curiosity, I think is such a beneficial thing for building relationships because it allows us to actually engage, right? Instead of to assume that just because I experience you in my lens one way, that that's the truth of the totality of who you are, right? So mm -hmm. it's, I just appreciate what you said. So hooray for curiosity. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, I, so with, with free thought, and, and maybe I, I didn't um, like underline this, but there really is not a prescribed set of beliefs, right? To be a free thinker, right? The, there, there are no quote unquote answers to the questions. It's, it's, it merely is concerned with how do you answer the questions, right? Whatever answers you come up with, that's great. If, if, you're, if you're following this method, that's great, but we're not going to prescribe you a set of, to, of answers to these questions. Uh, that's for you to figure out. And it's funny, just to mention another um, famous atheist who's become, I guess, kind of a bet noir, uh, Richard Dawkins in his book, um, The Ancestor's Tale, which in my opinion is his masterwork, much better than uh, The Selfish Gene or, or certainly The God Delusion. Um, he has this interesting little story about one of his mentors, scientific mentor. It's, it's almost written like a hagiography where he tells a story about this guy who's like worked his entire career in, in this one field of study, uh, animal behavior. And he's, he's been pursuing this thesis and, and everything that he's done has been to sort of provide the answer to these key questions in this, in this area. And he's very, very well regarded and very respected. Um, and they go to this conference and Dawkins is there and some young researcher presents a paper that completely destroys everything that the, the older researcher has done over his entire career, right? It completely shows how all these assumptions were false and here's contradicting information and we, we have to rewrite the paradigm. And Dawkins says, and, and the old professor got up he walked to the front of the room where the, the person had just finished giving the talk. And he gave him a big hug and he says, thank you. Thank you so much for, for challenging all, all the work that I've done. This is, this is great. This is, instead of being upset about it, he was actually thrilled to see someone toppled over his entire career, basically. And, and Dawkins ends the story by saying, this is, this is what we should aspire to. Like what, whatever we put out there, um, there's no reason to think that just because we came up with this idea that it's necessarily right and it can't be challenged. And we should celebrate and encourage other people to try to tear down our ideas because there's every reason in the world to think they might come up with something better. To me, that's the embodiment of humility. And mm -hmm. I think that that pairs very well with curiosity. Now, leave, your, leave all of your, your presuppositions and your certainty at the door. Just be curious and, and be humble with whatever it is you might find. You might find something you, you don't even expect. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And, and if I could uh, respond to what you were saying earlier, you, you know, you... Part of your problem, you said, I, you don't know how to reach um, the evangelicals that you wish yeah. you could reach. And, and <laughs> not that I, I have any advice, I, I don't, but I, I feel like the work that I'm doing with Peppa here in, in this community that, that I'd like to help her uh, build, I'm, I'm hoping maybe that would be an answer to that problem. Um, not that it's necessarily going to attract them, but perhaps if some of them are curious where, where they can hear about what we're doing, they can say a pastor and an atheist are building a community together, and then maybe they follow that curiosity. What, what is this about? What are they doing? What's, what's being talked about over here? And maybe they check great. it out, and maybe, yeah, maybe that doesn't necessarily change their mind about a lot of things, but, but maybe it kind of pulls them you know, towards a, a middle ground. Um, that's hope <laughs> be great. cheers to that <laughs> cheers to that <laughs> well Zach thank you um, this has been really like 
I, it's funny. I don't ever know really what to expect when we have folks who are not from the church world. Cause I'll like fully confess that the church world is so much of what I know that like Brad was one of the first atheists I've ever met in my life. Right. So like, <laughs> <I'll> just, <laughs> um, so it, this, it's always just really refreshing to hear new perspectives and new um, invitations into ways to view the world. Um, and I really, I love this story you just shared about we should all be working to invite and create space for others to maybe think bigger and better than we are, because mm -hmm. ultimately it's for the human good and it's for progress and it could ultimately create a better world for all of us. Like it's kind of the goal, right? Absolutely. So I, I just really appreciate that. And thank you so much for your time um, and your candor tonight. Well, thank you, Pat, but likewise on my end and, and Brad as well. And um, Brad is a very tough act to follow in terms of um, best atheists to know, but uh, I've done my best. <laughs> you're, you're, that's being very kind. <laughs> well, I'm glad to know you. And I, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm glad to know you both. Um, so, and I hope I've done a decent job of representing Christians in this space, <laughs> like maybe an alternative, an alternative to what so many have experienced. Um, so that's the hope at least. Certainly. Well, thank you again, Zach. We appreciate it. All right. I'll see you later. Those watching. Yeah, right. we'll see you back in two weeks, folks who are watching. And thanks so much. Have a great night. All right. Night, everybody.